Hello. Hello. Can I just take it from my hand? Hello. Um, welcome to Sea Gallery Salons. I'm uh, Jeffrey Lasso's Ferns, and I'm here at Sea Gallery. And tonight it is um, Day of the Dead 101. I want to open uh, the evening with a blessing, um, which is a traditional uh, way we uh, bless our altars, which I built behind us. So, Creator, thank you for bringing us together. This is in honor of the Huhugang, with your ancestral people of this land. I also want to thank my ancestors, known and unknown, the Kora, the Yaqui, and the Mestizos people. I want to thank Char and Amanda and our guests for being here tonight and in celebration of life and our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you. So, a <clears throat> little bit about life and death. Now, most people um, say, well, how, how long have you been uh, building altars? So, let me take you back to when I was about five years old. When I was five years old, I had experienced the first uh, traumatic death in my family. An uncle had passed away. My mother was a single mother, eight kids in Chandler, Arizona. And uh, she got us all dressed up in our little outfits and we went to the funeral. And of course we were terrified because we didn't know what death was. Um, but she had a way uh, of caring for us and sharing things with us. And uh, we went to the funeral and post funeral um, my mother always had altars in her house. Um, my mother was what's called a Guadalupana, a woman who follows the Virgin of Guadalupe. She wasn't a religious woman, but she was an extremely spiritual woman. So anytime something was going on in her life uh, or in her children's life, she'd go into her little bedroom um, and she'd light her candles and she'd say her prayers and her rosary and stuff. Um, so from five years old <clears throat> all the way up to her death, she always had an altar burning, a candle burning and stuff. And around special holidays, um, where she wanted to remember someone that had passed away, she would put together her altar. And there was always these pictures of my ancestors all over the uh, altar. And on the Dia de la Virgen, which is in December coming up, she would do this big, uh, beautiful altar in honor of the Virgin of Guadalupe. So as I grew up to be a man, I realized, uh, and I'd watched her do this as a little boy, as I was growing up, I found out that she learned from her mother and her grandmother all the way to how many grandmothers were all taristas and stuff. So when I moved to uh, San Francisco, I started working in the arts, and um, a friend of mine, a curator, wanted me to do an altar for uh, Day of the Dead for the Oakland Museum. And... Um, I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm going to do an art installation uh, for Day of the Dead. And she goes, huh? <laughs> I said, an art installation. She goes, you can't do an art installation. She goes, I'm going to come down. My mother never got on a plane, but she flew down with me. And she explained to me what an altar is and, and, and the penas, the, the pain and, and the meditations that go into each element of it. And she sat there in the museum with me as I was setting up this big and altar, altar. Um, and when she was done, she goes, now that's an altar. That's not an art installation. She taught me the ways of being sacred uh, through meditation and stuff. I'm not a religious man, but I'm a very spiritual man. So altars have been with me since childhood. Um, and every year, um, as we come to Day of the Dead or um, the Dia de la Virgen, when she passed away, I promised her that I would carry the tradition on, and I still do. In addition, what I found that altar building was for me was a way for me to reflect on life, on, um, on, on death. And I work with uh, several indigenous uh, medicine people, and one of my true mentors who's gone now shared with me that the ultimate uh, medicine in life is death. Because as we're born into this world, we are born into a unit with a mother, a child, and siblings. When one of that unit is sick, so is that rest of the bill. They may not fill it. And when the body can no longer hold the spirit, body dies and sheds. So it frees those living still in, in this life to heal and to walk that journey with them themselves. What we do in, in altar building is we reflect back on the positive and the good things <clears throat> that happen and transpired in that life. In the... Uh, 90s, I moved to San Francisco and I worked with um, uh, a nonprofit called Shanti. And I worked with um, people in end stages of AIDS in uh, single residence occupancy. We had four floors, um, 
age was hitting us really hard and stuff. And part of my work was not only the practical side of, of taking care of people, but helping people uh, move towards that space where they were going to transition. Um, I, my mother had eight kids. She lost three siblings, uh, three children. I lost three siblings. Um, I was deeply tied to all of those siblings, and some of them I helped transition. I was my mother's caregiver towards the end of her life, living with her, uh, which was a joy. Um, because one of the things that people give all the way to the end is life. And the promise I made to her was that I would continue this tradition uh, moving forward. So what I have here today in the gallery is, a, a, is an ofrena. It's not an art installation. These are my relatives and my friends and uh, family members of people here in the gallery that wanted to share the altar space with us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what is an ofrenda and how did this holiday start. Depending on who you're talking to, um, 30, uh, 3,500 to 5,000 years, it's uh, known to be an Aztecan uh, ritual of the celebration of life. There's also uh, older writings of uh, the Olmeca and the people that were uh, pre-Aztecan celebrating it as well. And then when Christianity moved into um, the Mexico, the Americas and stuff like that, the indigenous people of that area um, continued to celebrate life. And it was a little bizarre, I'm sure, for uh, Christians coming in and seeing skulls and, you know, um, all these um, elements of uh, earth, air, fire, and water, which are the four elements of an altar. Um, but as they tried to convert the indigenous to um, their Christian method, this altar building stayed and remained. You may know of it as an All Saints Day in Christianity. There's different variations of how it's called. And, 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 but in a, this celebration of life, is uh, 35 to 5,000 years old. So um, that's a little bit about my story. I'm going to take you through an ofrenda right now. So the an ofrenda, which translates to altar, is the welcoming back of the spirit. It's observed in households with the creation of ofrendas. The quality and degree of ornamentation of the ofrendas depends on regional traditions, family, and individual wealth, recent deaths, or the year's harvest. On the ofrenda, the main objects are symbolic of life's elements, water, wind, fire, and earth. Water is served in a clay pitcher or glass to quench the spirit's thirst from their long journey. Fire is signified by the candles that are lit. Wind is signified by papel picado, which is tissue paper cut out. The earth elements is represented by food, usually pan de muerto, which translates to bread of the dead. Other offerings include mole, fruit, chocolate, atole, toys, calaverita, de azúcar, and copal incense. So my altar here uh, is a reflection of my ancestral lands, which are here at the Sonoran Desert. Um, my um, tribal affiliations are Alcora, which is the mountains of Nayarit, and uh, the Sonoran Desert here, which is my uh, grandfather, Tara Lasso. So. so this is a reflection of my ancestral foods, my mother's ancestral foods, and um, the desert life here. So I'm going to take you through the pieces here of the ofrenda. I'm going to start with the skulls. So traditionally, um, skulls, when they were created in by individual households, a lot of this is commercial now. So you walk into uh, a store and you see a Day of the Dead. But originally, what the skulls were for was um, sometimes after the bodies were interred for a year. Um, and the natural part had gone back, the skeletons were um, removed and then decorated for the Day of the Dead celebration. Each uh, of these three pieces here is a reflection of three of my siblings that have passed away. I lost three siblings um, in the last eight years, all at the age of 44. We were very close to each other. My sister loved sunflowers. Um, my brother loved the color purple, and this is to my other brother. The reflection of the flowers in here, we don't believe, um, I wasn't raised in a heaven or a hell. My mother followed the Vedhan and she followed some of the Christian teachings, but she was a woman of uh, the Vedhan. So where I was taught is that we go back to the flower world. Um, so when we leave this earth and we leave our body, we are interred, 
And when you are tending your garden, when you stumble upon a rose, when you look at a sunset, um, when you smell the earth, you're connecting back with your ancestors. So the flowers in the skull for me are a reflection of me looking at my relatives, but also my relatives looking back at me. When I'm in the desert or in my garden, I'm in church, I'm in heaven. Um, and there is a deep connection that I've had since childhood that's been passed on from my mother, my grandmother, my great-grandmother about our connection to the earth. So the skull is also representative of the sweetness of life. Remember, an ofrenda, a celebration of life. So the sweetness of life, to savor the sweetness of life, because one day it won't be there. And one thing you're guaranteed in this life is that you will be born and that you will die. So when you do have sweetness in your life, to savor that sweetness. So that's the sugar's fault. The uh, water. Um, water is when the soul comes back, um, and, and the altars are built this way for a reason. And the water is so that the, the soul, uh, when it's thirsty, um, it has something to drink in the spirit. Um, I make my own flower wa water. These, uh, this water is uh, flowers that have been dehydrated from my garden and then um, repurposed in water for blessings and ceremonies and when I'm doing my meditations and stuff. So the connection from my garden to my plants, to my meditations, to my altars is in this cup of water. And I put this here so that my uh, spirit ancestors, uh, known and not known, are when they come back that they uh, have something to drink. The other element of uh, marigolds. And you've seen these a lot. Um, so marigold, the scent of the marigold is said to attract spirit. So if you go, and, if you look up Oaxaca Day of the Dead, you'll see these beautiful grave sites and uh, full of marigolds. The marigold is a beautiful flower. So traditionally on altars, this the spirit sends or senses the uh, marigold and is attracted to here. What you're doing when you're assembling an altar is you're putting elements of who's ever passed. Um, a remembrance for them so that when their spirit does come in, um, they recognize that that's where they're wanted and that's where they come. One of the other elements of an altar is salt. I don't know if you can see this. Um, so salt has always been a purification. Uh, um, and when spirit comes in so that you hold that spirit and it knows it's a safe place, but also that you release it back to whatever is beyond the veils, whatever is the mystery over there, the salt is a purification piece, not only for spirit, but for the altar itself. These flowers you see around the salt here are also from my garden. My mother, her favorite flower was red roses. I dry red roses and I save them for my altar. And also when I do uh, limpias, which are called cleansing, I use some of the flower water from that. Now, traditionally on an altar, um, depending on what part of Mexico you're in, um, it's called pan de muerto which translates to bread of the dead. And inside of it is a, is a little body. It's kind of shaped like a skull, depending on where you buy it from. I wasn't raised with pan de muerto. I was raised with um, atole, which is like a corn meal. Um, but what I did here for my altar, um, because I'm Sonoran Desert and stuff, is you can see here I have some of our ancestral foods. I have prickly pear, I have green tea, I have mesquite, I have hibiscus. Um, so all of these things, um, my mother was a naturalist without even knowing what a naturalist was. She could spend years in the garden, but she was always fascinated by my love for desert foraging. Um, so these are an honor for them coming back. For me personally, um, because I've experienced so much death, I, I, I meditated and I contemplated. Um, when someone dies close to me, I usually see them uh, in my dreams or in visits, whatever you want to call it, as they die. But as the years go by, and it's just about three to four years, they get younger and healthier and more vibrant and stuff. And I think that's the shedding that happens, that healing that happens when we disconnect from the negative aspects of death. And that's why you'll see here the, uh, the silver turquoises. Because when I meditate on my family and my siblings when I'm putting together an altar, I think of the joy and the shared experiences that were uh, funny. I have a playlist <laughs> that I put together of songs that remind me of them. So um, the other element is papel picado. 
So this is papel picado um, traditionally. So it's cut out paper. But what papel picado uh, does is, you know, the four elements again, air, earth, fire, and water. It allows spirit to come through as it blows. But it also reminds you the fragility of life, how easily life is, is, is taken away from us. So the tenderness of this paper and the fragility of this paper is a reminder during our honoring and our celebrations and stuff that we too shall go there, but also to celebrate those people around you. And if you can make amends with people you have uh, issues with, make those amends because we're only guaranteed to be born into that. So the fragility of life and wind is the Pacific Picado. Okay, I'm gonna share some uh, family members with you. Um, so this is my mother. Uh, her name is Maria Lazos Quintero. Um, she was born in here in uh, Douglas, Arizona. Um, single mother, eight kids, uh, Cora and Yaki um, is her affiliation. She was raised by her um, great, her grandmother, which is my great grandmother, Natalia Trujillo. Natalia Trujillo is Cora and she's from uh, Tepit Nayarit, the mountains of Tepit Nayarit. She was orphaned about 13 years old. Um, and her and her cousin made their way as orphans um, from Nayarit all the way to Douglas, Arizona, where she met her husband. Um, my grandmother, uh, Guadalupe, is her daughter, also born in Douglas. Um, and the reason I share these stories is because uh, oral history and the stories we carry for our family um, have to be shared and carried uh, and turned on. I get so many people who ask me, I don't know where I come from. I don't know my stories. Well, it's never too late to find out. And if you have elders around you, I bet you they would love to share um, those pieces with you. So I carry all these stories with me. Um, my brother Rowdy, um, who died about five years ago, and he's buried in the Guadalupe Cemetery. Um, beautiful young man. My brother um, Esteban, uh, his name was, uh, they call him Boco Loco, a little bit crazy because he was, um, passed away. Um, my sister Becky, um, she was a year older than me. Um, I spent time with her in the hospital and helped her pass and transition and, and helped her adult kids uh, understand what was happening to her. Um, a dear friend of mine, uh, Lynn, uh, who passed away about three years ago when I did her celebration of life in Oregon. And I carry these, these specific uh, images and pictures with me because as I start moving through altar work, they come to me and they're like, I want to, I mean, cause I have a ton of friends and people that have passed away, but they come to me and be it a song, be it a memory or something like that. And like, I feel what they're telling is don't forget me. Remember that, remember this. So that's why how I build my altar. Um, I have any questions so far from the. Well, I find it interesting that my history and my um, Somebody, when somebody passes, that you, know, you have a funeral and you talk about it, and you're sort of allowed to grieve for a year, and then the person you don't really talk about them anymore. And I remember being in Puerto Vallarta, and uh, it was Day of the Dead, and we walked through this cemetery, which was the most beautiful cemetery I'd ever seen. It was every grave was decorated and it was a celebration and that brought so much healing to me yeah. for um, people in my life that had died and I I started to see it differently and I and I wish that we that I had had some of that in my life and I guess I'm wondering when did that has that always been a tradition and why is it that that was is that way I think culturally, so um, she's at, uh, Shar is asking me, um, has the tradition always been this way? And um, I would say it's an evolution. Um, and being, walking in two worlds, meaning I'm walking in my indigenous world and I'm walking in my Western world, um, especially being here in Arizona in the United States, 
um, is a challenge. And it's really easy to erase um, or to forget, I would say, because um, that car, this song, this music, yeah. this going on politically. So it is a balance and it is a meditation piece. I would say um, maybe two of my siblings celebrate like me and the rest mm -hmm. don't. Um, I was fortunate enough to be very interested in, 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 in our culture and our stories and stuff like that. I also feel that wherever we come from, you know, be it Mexico or Scotland, or we're all people of the earth. We all have our stories, our ancestors, our, our medicines, our grandparents. And when we remember those things, we share a commonality. Um, in our births and our dads. You can look at Japan and the Koreas and, and all over the world where these celebrations are taking place. But is that connection to our ancestral lines. I really feel um, potently my DNA. When I make tamales and I teach my younger you know, nieces and nephews how to make tamales, most people say, well, tamale is a, a Mexican food. No, tamale is 10,000 years old. When the first chile and the first corn was cultivated, the mothers and the grandmothers were making tamales 10,000 years ago. So we have to connect on a deeper level, level to our ancestral lines. If, if you know you're Scottish, my father's Irish, so I, you know, I have that aspect of me too that I would love to explore because then I could see our medicine and those other pieces of our DNA. But I believe we all carry a story inside of us and then we can peel it like an onion, little by little, to get back to that point where we're connected not only to uh, place, but nature and the bigger, wider aspects of who we are as humans. Um, so it is a process and it is a discipline. There are some, with the pandemic going on right now, and everything else going on in the world. You know, last year, if you if you did come to my house, my whole front yard was an altar, my whole backyard was an altar. A beautiful, beautiful. I don't have the energy to do that this year. And I was thinking, I'm not gonna do anything. And then mom was like, me <laughs> So this is a reflection of that piece and I'll do something intimate at the house. So it's a discipline to carry stories and it's a discipline to unveil who we are as human beings. And it's not always the easiest thing to understand our pain um, because death isn't always beautiful. But when you move through that morning, when you move through that process of, of healing, then all you have left is beauty. But it is work. And for some of us, we don't want to work <laughs> or we don't have the capacity to work. Um, I would say uh, for me, my, my altars keep getting more and more minimal, you know, um, which is interesting for me because I'm going further and further into nature. And I used to joke about, well, the world's an altar. It's not a joke for me anymore. I could walk outside in that desert right there, you know that. <laughs> and I just see this magnificence around us. So when I honor my stories, I do it intimately like that. When I honor, honor our stories, which are our bigger stories, I do that in my work and how I walk and how I treat other human beings. Because um, we are interconnected in that way. Um, any other questions regarding altars? Yeah, I've got a question. Speaking of the pandemic and with everything going on, there's a lot of people all over the world who are losing a lot of family members. Um, some people I know they lose like a lot of their family. Yeah. Some people lose none, right? So for people who, especially in Western cultures, like uh, specifically in the United States, if they've never had any sort of traditions in their family, there's never really been much respect for the dead. It's kind of just like, well, this happened and we don't talk about it anymore. Yeah. What's like the, a couple of takeaways that people like even right now that they can just practice whether it's on a weekly basis or when they just have the energy to that so they can take away from this. That's a really good question. And, and um, so the pandemic, I've, I've lost 12 friends and colleagues um, in less than four months. Um, very dear people to me. Um, I was talking to Shar earlier about, you know, a salon here and doing this. And, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this is because I really believe that post pandemic, with the amount of death that's gone on globally, that there's going to be some PTSD, there's going to be some trauma. When we can finally breathe, we are going to feel the impact of what happened to humanity in this short period of time. 
And part of doing this is taking care of yourself holistically. Am I taking care of myself, mind, body, and spirit? This is a spiritual practice, but it also helps your mind and your physical body. To answer your question, a meditation, an altar, you know, a simple altar. If you go to the Smithsonian uh, Latino Institute online, they will show you very easily how to assemble or alter those components. My um, response is to personalize it. You are better than anybody else in your ability to take care of yourself if you believe in it. You know what you need. You know what you need holistically and stuff. Ask yourself. Um, take a walk. Go to that place that makes you uh, uh, feel good and say, I need something. What do I need? And you'll get an answer. I get, you'll get a response and stuff like that. Um, so I would start with an altar. And I would start morning now. I'm not saying morning in the sun. You can't say morning. <laughs> But reflecting on the time that we're in right now um, and reflect on it and say, how do I want to look when I come out of this? Because when I go into this altar piece, when I was driving up here today um, from Phoenix, I had my playlist on and my sister, uh, Becky, we scattered her ashes off the Mogollon Rim. Um, we got into my car and the car wouldn't start. And I'm like, oh great, I'm on the Mogollon Rim. I can't get down. It finally started and full blast came on uh, Diana Ross. Uh, Someday we'll be together. <laughs> <laughs> so that song's on my playlist. So I knew Becky was going to be on my altar today because she's always with me. and uh, I carry her, but I wanted her to be with me when I was doing this. So I created a playlist. Technology is good if you use it in the right way. <laughs> so create a playlist. Um, create a playlist of medicine. This is medicine. It, one of my mentors, a medicine person, told me, you know, Jeffrey, everything is medicine. Life and laughter and pain and suffering and uh, joy and, and death, you know. So when you think of what you're going through as medicine, though it may be bitter, swallow it. Savor it. Put it out there. You know, because what happens, I think, as humanity, when we get to the point where we feel safe again, because I think I don't think we feel safe again, we will. It will hit us, and it will hit us big. So part of this tonight is taking care of yourself. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, I know you've got uh, some things to do tonight. I want to thank you for coming and spending the time with us. The altar is going to be up uh, probably till next week. Um, if you have somebody you want to add to it, um, feel free. Um, there'll be uh, ceremony and blessings on it. Oh, you know what I wanted to share with you, um, which I didn't. The other element to an al uh, altar um, is an incense. Um, you, it's usually copal from the copal tree. Um, I have uh, gifted sage and tobacco from a uh, two-spirit uh, friend of mine and juniper. Um, so the other piece you could remember, and if you took notes on the other piece, is to add an incense piece of that. Um, so anyway, um, blessings to you all. Take care of yourselves. Uh, love those around you. Celebrate life. Celebrate um, those who's lived with you. They're inside of you. And uh, thank you for attending the Gallery Salon. Salud. Yes. 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 Yes.